Hi, in this video, we want to take a look at monitoring network optimization using R. All right, so the idea of this video is that over a geospatial region, I have some monitors that record numeric data. Now, what I want to do is I want to remove sensors, locations that are not providing informative information, considering all the other sensors that are in the network. And I want to find places where I should add a sensor to improve the information quality that I'm getting. All right, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna take an example from Applied Spatial Data Analysis with R, Chapter 8, and we're going to run through that to show conceptually how we do this. Now, something about this is that this actual example is not a monitoring network at all. It's just data, but conceptually, we can run through the process to see how we would go about doing this if the data we had was from a monitor instead of static samples. All right, so this is coming from chapter eight of Applied Spatial Data Analysis with R. Here are the authors. Here is the textbook's website, asdar-book.org, and you can download this book for free from UCF's library. All right, so let's go ahead and start digging into this. So imagine the situation that I have sensors monitoring some numeric variable throughout a geospatial region. Now, what I want to do I want to reduce the number of locations that I'm monitoring as much as possible. I'll save money and reduce uh, effort and time on maintenance. Also, I want to be able to find locations where I should put a sensor down to give information. All right, so the more locations we monitor, the more time, money, and effort we have to commit to it. So we're gonna eliminate locations that provide little informative value. And we're also going to try and find locations that would contribute a lot if I added them into my network. Okay, so something that you'll notice if you work through this is that frequently the points with the densest region of points will be like high on that list to get rid of first. Now, when I consider removing a point, why the point of view that I have is considering all of the other points involved, is this one informative? So it's conditioning on every single other point providing information, does this one provide additional informative value? If the, if the location is close to average of all the other points, then really we view that as not being informative. All right, so there's a couple of approaches to this. So let's, the first one we're gonna talk about is using the mean creating variance to find sites to eliminate. Okay, so our point of view is that if we don't have variability going on, then it's constant, it's static, approximately speaking, and then it's not really that informative. It's just kind of stuck around a particular value. What we're more interested in is where we have variability on what's going on. So we want where there is more variance going on for our locations. All right, so to run through the example, we're going to extract the prediction variance for each location that we want in the model. Now, if you run this code, using ordinary Kriging is going to be printed for each row observation in the data set. And that was just a whole bunch. It was like 155, something like that. I didn't want all that crud on there. So I went ahead and uh, suppressed it using our markdown output. But if you run this code, you'll see that. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. For each row of data that I have, I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna make a Kriging model with the, the formula that I'm interested in. I'm going to go through and I'm going to use all but that point, that one single point. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to predict over the entire region that I'm modeling. Here's my model that I have, which we established in a previous video. And then I'm going to get the variance of the prediction at each of the sites. Now, after that, I'm going to take the average of the variances. Okay, so what this is doing is I'm taking the variance over all the possible locations that I am uh, trying to model 
using my uh, Kriging model. And then I take the average for removing that point. So each point, why do I take each point, remove it from the, from the data set, build by model, get the prediction variance across the entire region of interest, take the average, connect that average variance to the point that was removed. Do this over and over and over. So if we see that we're not getting very much variability out of this, then that's probably a site that we could get rid of and it, we're not gonna lose informative value. So now what we're gonna do, we're going to find the site with the lowest prediction variance average. And so I'm gonna use the which function. I want to find which row when I removed it resulted in the minimum prediction variance across the entire modeled region. And so here we can see that this is row 72 of the original data. And so now just to kind of see what's going on, I can see that its prediction variance was about 0.2. And that was the smallest of all the points. So if I was to remove this one point, since the variance is less than everywhere else, I interpret that as this one's giving the least informative information by this criteria. Therefore, I would be losing the least if I got rid of this. Now, if I want to remove another point, then I would want I would want to go through this entire process all over again. Now, the textbook does talk about the theoretical probability aspects of uh, of trying to deal with removing two, removing three, removing four, and so so on. To keep it conceptually and computationally feasible, I would recommend remove the like the worst one and if I had to remove a second, then I would repeat the entire process and remove one point. If I need to remove a third, I would pre repeat the whole process and re remove the third one until I reached the point where I was good with my network. Now, that is honestly, op from an optimis optimization point of view, that's not the best way. But in terms of computation time, in terms of being conceptually feasible, I think the sequential approach is better. The textbook, the author does a good job of explaining how this is how the sequential approach would not be best, but I think it's worth it just because it's easier to implement. All right, so let's go ahead and visualize the prediction variances. And I'm just using regular old plot function. And so we can see that this point has this point had like the largest variance. And then all of these are about the same. And so I'm gonna guess that these points are all probably pretty close to each other, honestly. And it probably wouldn't make much of a difference if I remove the second, third or fourth instead. But so these ones over here would be the ones I want to remove the least. These are the ones I would look to removing the most with the one that I would start with removing is the far left. All right, so now another way, way that we can approach this is that we can try to find locations with uh, data close to a particular value. So sites with data close to a sample mean contribute to shrinking the sample variance. So think about this. If I have a data set, let's say a, a, a collection of numbers, and I walk up and I add the sample average from that data set, and I add the sample, not add, I tack on the sample average, and I tack on the sample average, and I tack on the sample average. Sample average stays the same from, you know, tacking on the sample, the sample average. And so what would end up happening is that ultimately my variance would be shrinking because when we would do the subtraction part of the variance, we would be getting zero, but the denominator would be increasing in the sample, sample variance point of view. And so when we look at this, if I see values that are close to the average, then it, from this point of view, from this way of measuring, those locations are not providing very much informative value. So the points that are really close to like the sample average, or we could go with median or some other value of interest. And if, if it's close to that, then we, we would just be like, hey, let's go ahead and get rid of those because it's not helping me out. All right, so let's go ahead and do this. All right, so what we need to do 
is I'm going to use the S apply function once again. I'm going to go down row by row. Once again, I'm removing one data point from it. So the, the row that I'm interested in, I'm removing that row from the data. I build my Krigging model. And now I check how close is my value, assuming a Gaussian distribution, how close is it to being the value of interest. So this is log of the cutoff. So I've got log in my model here. And the cutoff is a value that is pre-established. This could also just be like the, you know, the overall sample mean, but it could be any particular value I choose. And then here we just take the average across all the points that we're modeling on. All right, so now we're going to use a which function to find the one that is the farthest off. And we can see that we have very little variance. So remember, if it's close to the central tendency, over, more than likely it's gonna have small variance, small informative value. And so there we go. And so here, I'm using the P norm, that if the P norm is large for the quantile, then this is working out to be close to what the two, uh, you know, is, is working out to be, give us less information. All right, now let's go ahead and visualize what's going on. Here I'm just setting out, setting up the layout. Here I'm saving the parameters before I change them. Set up the parameters, plot the image of the region of interest as all gray. And here is using the variance criteria we're gonna visualize. So we go ahead and just slap down those points. We're gonna slap down the points that have a low, uh, lower criteria and then greater, uh, greater than the quantile of 0.9. Here is less than the quantile of 0.1. Here we're going to repeat where we're using close to a given value criteria. And once again, I'm going quantile with 0.1 and quantile of 0.9 on this one. And here we can see our points applied very nicely. And so we can see like here, the points that are all clustered together are more likely to be the ones that we would remove. And we'll, we notice that we get different points by different criteria. Honestly, looking at this, I like the variance criteria better. And now here I'm just returning my parameters to the default settings. All right, so now let's talk about some other packages that we can use for interpolation in geostatistics. All right, so random fields offers a wider range of possibilities in terms of sample variograms and variogram fitting. So they can use least squares, maximum likelihood, and restricted maximum likelihood. They, they offer uh, simple Krigging and ordinary point Krigging. So it's a little bit more limited on the Krigging models. And random fields, the package, gives us unconditional and conditional simulation. Uh, and, um, you know, we have uh, some, some other methods for uh, getting through the simulations if we want to do something other than sequential. And we have both spectral methods and Fourier transform methods, which is very nice. All right, so here is some information about random fields. So we need to see like who's contributing. We can see the package version who we need to talk to if we want to get information about it. So this package provides methods for the inference on and the simulation of Gaussian fields. Uh, furthermore, methods for the simulation of extreme value random fields are provided. 
Now here, the thing I really liked about this is that it's easy to see what models are available. And so here we can go circular, cut off, uh, integer n, TBM, uh, spectral, direct, sequential, trend, average, coins, hyper P, and uh, uh, specific, specificity. And so here, it's real easy. If I know what I want, I can go down this line and I can fig figure out what it is I want for my particular model. And here is, you know, how I call it. And there's a whole bunch in there. Now the GOR package, where this really comes into play is if I want to use Bayesian spatial statistics. All right, so everything that we've done in the video so far have had nothing to do with Bayesian. And now if you need to do Bayesian, you need to do Bayesian. Uh, usually my experience, the times that we should use Bayesian is number one, when the client wants us to, my experience is that usually clients want it when they don't really understand the difference between frequentist and Bayesian. The other time that comes up is, in my opinion, when I have very little data, but I have prior information that I want to pull in to kind of balance out that data lacking. So if I have lacking data and I, but I have a prior distribution that I can be reasonably certain of, then Bayesian models fill in the gaps. Also, a good feature of Bayesian is that it actually gives a more complete representation of the situation than regular frequentist models. Now, that more complete representation, is that useful? Maybe it hasn't been for me professionally yet, but I can see the potential for it. All right, so GOR you know, helps us with view, uh, variogram estimation, variogram model function fitting. It uses either least squares or some form of maximum likelihood. For Krigging, it will do ordinary point Krigging, universal Krigging. So there are some, uh, you know, in the uh, GSTAT package, there are some Krigging models that are not in here. Or we can do Bayesian Krigging with the Krig Bayes function. And everything is based off of Gaussian. So that's important. If that doesn't really fit your modeling, you're kind of stuck with it because this is how it is. If you want something a little bit slicker, you would have to code it yourself, maybe in RJAX uh, manually. All right, so Bayesian Krigging requires the user to specify priors for each variogram model parameter, but your trend coefficients, you don't have to. You can, but you don't have to. And then, so that's our, our prior, the Krieg Bayes function will go ahead and compute the posterior for us. Now, GOR has its own class of spatial data. And so a uh, disadvantage of this is that it has its own format that you have to have it in. Uh, one thing that is nice though, it has methods to convert point data to SP format. And so here's just a quick example of using the GOR variogram function. I just tell it what my data is. So here I'm taking SP data format and I'm converting it over to as geo data. And I'm saying the maximum distance between points is uh, 1,500. And here I get my variogram. Now, GOR uses the X valid function for leave one out cross validation. And this re estimates model parameters that is trend and variogram coefficients when leaving out each observation. Also, GOR provides an interactive function. Um, I feel like interactive is, it sounds good on paper, but in implementation, usually I don't think it's, it works out being as good as you think it would. Now, if I want to extend this, the GOR GLM, generalized linear model, extends GOR to binomial and Poisson processes and includes Bayesian and conventional Krigging uh, methods. Now, something about this is that 
it uses Monte Carlo Markov chains. And so MCMCs can be very, very slow to get through the process. And so if I have a larger data set, Monte Carlo Markov chains probably are not a good idea. Uh, you know, so just as a general rule, in my opinion, if you're going to be using if you're going to be using Bayesian statistics, if you can go with a prior distribution, a conjugate prior, a conjugate prior, do it. Make your life easier. MCMCs are powerful. They will fit any data set very, very well, but they have they take a long time to run. That you have problems with convergence, and uh, frankly, they can converge on points that or converge on uh, posteriors that are not really the best posterior possible. All right, well, that's all I've got for you. Take care and goodbye.